One million subscribers. Thank you so much. You guys are awesome, but not a single one of us is as awesome as this guy. My name's Carol Shelby and performance is my business. <laughs> The Cobra, the Daytona, the GT350. You ever heard of them? Of course you freaking heard of them. Grab a snack and a chair because Papa's gonna tell you babies a story. The story of one of my idols. He's an American hero from humble beginnings in East Texas to kicking butt around the world. This man did it all. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on Carol <laughs> Shelby. Carol Hall Shelby was born in 1923 in Leesburg, Texas. His dad was a mailman and his mom stayed at home to look after the babies. What I'm saying is they didn't have a lot of money, just like my dad. To make matters worse, Carol was kind of a sick kid, much like your boy. I had asthma, but he had a heart condition that kept him in bed for most of his childhood. But once he got older, the doctors gave him a clean bill of health, and he was out of the house tearing apart go-kart engines and learning everything he could about things that went vroom, vroom, vroom. When the US got pulled into Dub Dub 2, he joined the Army Air Corps where he trained pilots and probably went on a bunch of secret missions, knowing Carol. <laughs> One afternoon when the Sarge wasn't looking, Carol hopped in a trainer plane and took off. He flew for miles until he was over the house of his crush and dropped a love letter into her front yard. Aww. A year later, they were married. Good move, Gene. Coincidentally, I delivered my divorce papers to Jessica's house with a Tomahawk missile. <laughs> Bullseye. After the war, Carol went looking for a new line of work. He tried his hand in the dump truck game and even worked in the oil fields as a roughneck, which I've tried and it sucks. I told my boss my neck was getting all rough and he was like, yeah. It's in the name. And I was all, oh, that makes sense. Now that I think about it, I'm kind of embarrassed for bringing it up. You know what? I appreciate the opportunity. I don't think this is for me. I'm gonna go try and make car videos. Do you guys validate parking? I'm in the orange lot. When those jobs didn't work out, Carol got into chicken farming, where it turns out he made a nice little chunk of change. It was around this time that he also started pursuing his real passion. Racing. Shelby put his Texas charm to good use and convinced a friend to let him drive his MGTC streetcar on the track. In his first time out in the puny British Roadster with a wooden frame, he beat the entire field of race prepped competitors just like that. He was hooked on winning. Mere hours later, he entered another race full of faster Jaguar XK120s, you know, for fun, and against all odds, he drove the little MG to victory, beating cars with twice the horsepower. If it wasn't clear before, it was now. Carol Shelby knew a thing or two about going fast. People were fascinated by this man. He was on an entirely new level from anyone else. Carol would go on to drive for Aston Martin at Sebring and Le Mans and set Bonneville land speed records for Austin Healey later that year. He continued racing and winning through the 50s and by 1959, he was looking to win in a car of his own design. Kind of like me in the Pumphrey 502. We never got a shot, you know? Carol was a big Chevy fan and really wanted their help to develop a new lightweight V8 powered racing platform. So he hit them up and he was like, guys, I'm a big Chevy fan and I'd like your help to develop a new lightweight V8 powered racing platform. And Chevy was like, okay, cool. Here's three Corvettes. And Carol was all, I'm gonna keep the guts over here and work on them with all my buddies. And I'm sending the chassis over to Italy to get some new skin. What? There's this guy, Sergio Scaglietti. Literally, this dude makes the best skins. What the hell does he mean by skin? I bet he's got a snake fetish. You think everyone has a snake fetish? 
What came back were three of the classiest Corvettes ever made. The Corvette de Scaglietti. But Chevy passed while the Scagliettis were being built. GM had decided to ban their brands from racing altogether. It was the 1960s season and the heart condition Carroll had suffered as a kid had returned. In his final race at the Continental Divide Raceway, Carroll had a nitroglycerin tablet under his tongue to deal with the chest pain. Despite this, the dude won. It wasn't easy, but Carroll made peace with the fact that this would be his last season as a driver. Thanks for watching Up to Speed. That's what? the story of Carroll Show. It's shorter than usual. Just freaking kidding! Just because he stopped racing didn't mean he was done with motorsport. He opened his own racing school and was soon wheeling and dealing to develop his own race car. And this time, nothing would stop him! First, he called Aston Martin. They were like, no. Then he caught word that another British company, AC, had lost the engine supplier for their Ace Bristol Roadster. This was great news. Shelby was obsessed with the idea of an American V8 powered roadster beating the European competition. And he figured a car like the Ace would be the perfect candidate. All he needed was an engine. Shelby went back to Chevrolet to see if they were interested. They weren't. So he went elsewhere for help. Elsewhere being Chevy's biggest rival. Carol heard through the grapevine that Ford was developing a new V8 and Ford loved Shelby's idea of building a race car that could beat the vet. They were on board and Shelby was on Ford. AC sent Carol an ace roller to his shop in Venice, California. When the smoke cleared, Shelby's obsession was manifested and the AC Cobra was born. The combination of lightweight British engineering and brute American strength was ferocious, just like Nolan at a Dairy Queen. But the best for the Shelby snake was yet to come. Shelby had already won Le Mans as a driver. Now he wanted to go back to France and win again, this time as the guy who built the car. And that car was the Cobra. But just like a math quiz, there was a problem. The Cobra was perfectly suited for the tracks here in the US, but at Le Mans, the Cobra was an average 10 seconds a lap slower than the slippery for lollies. <laughs> <laughs> Carol was not a fan of being slower than other people. So he ordered a young engineer named Pete Brock to come up with a solution. While Carol was a big believer in horsepower, the subtle nuances of aerodynamics weren't exactly his Forte. Pete took the body off of one of their Cobras at the shop and got to work on a new design. It had radical aerodynamic features like an aggressive ducktail spoiler and an absolutely flat rear end. <laughs> Jessica. One day, Carol brought an airplane engineer friend to the shop and the dude straight up told Pete that the car wouldn't work. To his face! After the guy left, Carol goes to Pete and he goes, Pete, you want to change anything? And Pete was all, nope, straight up, respect. But I'm gonna be honest with you. If this thing doesn't work, you're fired. They took the car, dubbed the Daytona Coupe out to Riverside International Raceway for some testing. After a warm-up lap, lead test driver Ken Miles put the hammer down and beat their Cobra track record by three and a half seconds. <laughs> Pete had done it, and Carol could now take the fight to Ferrari. Your days are over, mister. 1964, the Cards beat the Yankees in the series, Buffalo Wings are invented, and Team Shelby American went across the pond to France with their new car in tow. They entered the Daytona in the GT class where it would face off against Porsches, Alfa Romeos, Lotus I, and of course, the Ferrari 250 GTO. 
The sleek body allowed the Daytona to hit 186 miles an hour down the Molson Strait. And the ducktail glued the rear end of the pavement, giving drivers Bob Bondurant and Dan Gurney immense confidence in the turns. When the race was over, the Daytona had finished a lap ahead of the closest Ferrari, giving Shelby the class victory. The win was a reminder to the world that the Shelby name meant the winner's circle. To commemorate the win, Shelby wanted to make the Cobra even faster. Like a good old Texan, Carol wanted an even bigger V8 in his prized Roadster. So Shelby teamed up with Ford again, and together they set out to design a new Cobra. The fenders would be flared out to make room for wider tires, and the grill would be opened up into a gaping maw to help with cooling. To make this car a touch easier to drive, this Cobra would be fitted with coil spring suspension. That's fancy. Real fancy. The updated Mark III Cobra was so different than the previous models that only the hood, trunk, and windshield were shared between them. The Mark III's crown jewel lived under its hood, Ford's most advanced engine of the time. The 427! What the? Sorry, sorry. I was just trying to help. This humongous seven liter V8 made 485 horsepower and pushed the tiny Cobra to a blistering 185 miles an hour. That same year, 1965, Carroll got the ball rolling on another legendary Shelby creation, the GT350. Shelby American took the pony car and they made it a freaking thoroughbred. They focused most of their attention on handling, but also boosted the output by 35 horsepower. <laughs> The GT350's finishing touch was a sinister looking and functional hood scoop on the front. All it needed was a name, the Cobra. The car was designed for SCCA sports car racing and since it was a Shelby, it dominated! Lightning, 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 lightning! Like this video if you like lightning, I'm gonna get thumbs! After the GT350, Carroll and the team found time to help their friends at Ford win Le Mans with the GT40. If you want to know more about that story, check out this episode right here. I cry in it. Ford continued using the Shelby name on their special edition Mustangs, but Carroll's team wasn't doing a lot of development on the cars. In fact, Working with Ford directly on production cars was pretty stressful, and they ended the partnership in 1969. All of the wheeling and dealing and racing for the past 30 years had taken a toll on old Carroll. He was exhausted, so he did what all the greats do when they're overwhelmed. He took some time off in Africa. He just needed a vacation, like me, Matt. <laughs> He also made chili powder, which you can still buy today, available on Amazon for $10. When he got back to the States, he was feeling good, at ease. That was until Detroit came calling once again in 1982. Except this time, it wasn't Ford, but Chrysler. When Carroll was working on the GT350, he met a guy named Lee Iacocca, the genius largely responsible for the Mustang. Now, his old buddy Lee was in charge of Chrysler, and he was in a bind. He wanted to develop performance models for Dodge, but no one at the company knew how to do it, so Lee called Carroll up, and he was like, Carroll, I'm in a bind. I want to develop performance models for Dodge, but no one at my company knows how to do it. The age of muscle cars was long gone, so now all Shelby had to work with were turbocharged four bangers, like the Omni hatchback and Charger Coupe. At first, Carroll was just a consultant, but soon he and his team were getting their hands all over them little cars. The Omni GLH, or goes like hell, was already pretty quick. In fact, it was the fastest hatchback in the world at the time. <laughs> But Shelby did it one better. The Omni GLHS, or goes like hell some more, made 175 horsepower, which was a lot for the time in an itty bitty car like that. <laughs> The Omni sister car, the Charger GLHS, was basically a two-door version and did the quarter mile in 16 seconds at 86 miles an hour. Again, very fast at the time. Back then, 50 bucks was like a lot of money. Believe me, it was fast. 
The Dodge Twins were a far cry from the race cars Carroll made his name building, and everyone knew it. Looking back on the project, he said, I got so much crap building those little hot rods, but you know what? I had fun doing it. And the fact that he said that is why he's so important to us. Carroll took another break to get his head right and chill out, and he did. He got so chill, you guys. But like a vagabond father who shows up with Christmas presents in June, Dodge came calling again, this time to work on a real sports car. The project would be Chrysler's middle finger to the world, screaming, Hey! We still know how to make a badass race car! Iacocca's buddies, Bob Lutz and Tom Gale, were putting a team together to build a car in the spirit of Shelby's own Cobra. They couldn't call it the Cobra, obviously, so they chose another snake name. And here it is, the Dodge Viper. Which you can learn more about right here. Shelby himself drove the Viper as the 1991 Indy 500's pace car, where apparently he played this really cool prank where he pretended to have a heart attack behind the wheel at 125 miles an hour, and he scared the out of the passenger. Another reason, I love this guy. Then, in 2002, Shelby found himself at home for the first time since 1969. Ford was working on a new GT, and they thought, who better to bring on board than the savior of the original GT40? The partnership also produced a new Cobra concept that used the GT's running gear, except in the front. That concept never went into production, but at its debut, Shelby proclaimed, I'm gonna end my car building days where I started them. The partnership continued with the debut of the 2007 Shelby GT500, the first Mustang to wear Shelby's name in 35 years. It made 500 horsepower and looked good as hell doing it. On top of that, you could send your GT500 to Shelby's plant in Las Vegas to get the surprise, surprise, super snake treatment, where it was upgraded to over 600 horsepower. Carol may have been old, but he still loved power. The Mustang got a redesign in 2010, and with it came a new GT500. At 87 years old, Carol knew he didn't have much time to leave one more mark on the world of power and performance. The last GT500 Carol touched would make 662 horsepower and do 202 miles an hour in a Mustang. Are you crying? It was the most radical Shelby creation in years, and rightfully, it blew people's minds. It was a fitting send-off for the legend that was Carroll Shelby. Around the same time as the GT500's release, Carroll passed away at Baylor Hospital in Dallas, Texas on May 10th, 2012, about 100 miles from his birthplace in Leesburg. Shelby's influence on the automotive world cannot be, un cannot be overstated. He didn't have but he destroyed people who did. And that's why I'm proud to call him my dad. A little over a year ago, we were a pretty small channel. And now, thanks to you, you guys, I'm talking about you, guy or girl watching this, you've made it the one million subscribers. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Donut means everything to me. It's all because of you that we get to make things. It's for you and because of you. And I promise that me and the 15 other amazing people that work here, most of whom you guys never see, will continue to stay up late and work on weekends and bring you guys the stuff that you like. And we'll continue to listen to you to figure out what you want. So thank you. Um, if you want to buy this shirt, go to shop. Dot donut dot media watch these episodes i really love you thank you <laughs>